any of the rights, company rights, investor rights, but what about entrepreneur rights? Similarly, in terms of the documents, how much flexibility entrepreneur has, what sort of employment agreement entrepreneur has, what is the vesting or pledging of entrepreneur shares, or even if though they're common stock, those also are important points. And that typically gets glossed over. Uh, but coming back to a simple answer, I would not prefer VCs to intervene on an operational matter at all. Yeah, I, I, uh, every VC has a different approach. Our approach, and, and it's not better or worse, is very hands-on. Because, see, the country is young. And this isn't the seventh or eighth startup that these kids have been hand... Look at housing.com, right? The, the, the negative, the uh, too young... Uh, you know, you kind of met, when you were 20, you had the same ego. The issue is, fr from our perspective, we have seen no entrepreneurs perfect. Right? Somebody's good at finance, somebody's good at technology, somebody's good at sales. So we spend so much time in helping them with operations issues, finance issues, these transportation issues, security issues, because that's what it takes to run a growth but business. Let, entrep let entrepreneur yeah. come to you. Yeah, Don't intervene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stelish, I have a more I have an interesting question, okay? So we talked of Flipkart and so on and so forth. So let's talk about you know this whole concept of scale that you know at some point in time a business will reach scale and profitability. Today, Flipkart does about 1.2 crore transactions a month, right? With over a billion dollars in GMV on a month. Today's run rate, right? And it burns about 25% of that a month, which means that it requires anything between half a billion to 750 million a year just to stay alive, right? What is scale if 1.2 crore transactions a month don't qualify as scale? I mean, when does, when does one say, yes, this is scale, right? A $12 billion GMV and growing, yeah. right? And, and we're still saying that they have permission and to continue to lose money till they become what? 50 billion? 100 billion? When do you want, when do you want, when do you want the management to be answerable for a bottom line? Okay, so there's an interesting question. Now, since I do not sit on the board of the <laughs> 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 So I won't be able to comment on that. So I believe that the board there is pretty smart people. They know what they're doing. And they're, they're very much aware and confident of the fact, right? Coming to this point, I told uh, long back that the company can become profitable any day they want. They, they know that and their numbers are very, very much in their target range and they can do that. Uh, they are choosing not to become profitable. Okay, as I know from some brands which is retail on Flipkart, they pay close to 40% commission to Flipkart and they don't complain about it. They are paying it. And I am seeing more and more private labels which are going. So look at a, a small retailer. Even a small retailer, I mean somebody who is doing say 30 crore, 40 crore sales, right? So if you want to sell, right, one shop, you have to stock it properly. Minimum amount is close, down, close, close to a crore, two crores, right? To properly stock is your shop. Say you are manufacturing t-shirts. So to have one your exclusive store, you will have close to a crore rupees stock in one store. And if you have 100 stores, you have close to 100 crores inventory floating around which after three or six months or a one year will come back because India works on SOR model, sales or return, right? So one year you have no visibility where the inventory is floating around. You pay 40% commission to your retailer and that inventory is all everywhere. You sell at Flipkart, inventory sits with you, you know what inventory is there and you get 40% margin. So which business why? So I think overall there is a lot of sense in the platform. Coming to a question, I do not know why they are choosing to Thank you all the speakers and members from the audience as well for pouring in your thoughts, your inputs at this repository of the Ecom Marketplace Conference 2015. And here I have Ms. Anand uh, ready to hand over the mementos to our panelists. And here we go. Mr. Shailesh Vikram Singh, please put your hands together for him for his wonderful contributions. I request ma'am to hand over the memento to Mr. Alok Bansal. With your continuous applauses, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Next we have in the league, Mr. Peesh Chopra. <coughs> Ma'am, please present a memento to Mr. Rohit Dave now. We're really grateful to you all. And last we have Mr. Varun Tandon. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. And yes, one more uh, photograph with the presenter and the panelist. And I want the audience to clap, uh, you know, your, for your own self, for the panelists.
for your enthusiastic participation. Thank you so much. Uh, so yes, the clock does indicate that it's time to break for tea and coffee. Enjoy the same, but I request you all to please be back by 4.45 p.m. sharp. To evaluate consumer rights in e-commerce transactions in India, protection of consumer rights against the quality of products and services being delivered by these companies is a very important aspect that cannot be overlooked. To find out ways and cogitate on this subject, let me first of all welcome our moderator for this panel discussion, Mr. Michael S. Mensik, partner, Baker and McKenzie. Thank you for those applauses uh, with the energy you've just regained. As one of the lead attorneys for Baker and McKenzie, IT outsourcing privacy practice, Mr. Mensik counsels companies on how to structure, negotiate, and manage their internal and external sourcing arrangements, from IT infra infrastructure to various business processes. He has spoken at numerous conferences on IT-related topics, including outsourcing and offshoring, Marketing and Protecting Software and Telecommunications Products and Services. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Joining him on the stage next is Mr. Arvind Singhatia, VP Corporate Affairs, Ola Cabs. Please put your hands together for him. He has worked with the industry associations of international repute in areas of technology, skill development, e-commerce, and modern retail trade, including FICI, PhD Chambers of Commerce and Industry, Center for Entrepreneurial Development. Hello, sir. I further request Mr. Faisal Farooqi, founder and CEO of MouthShut.com to please come forward. Please welcome him with your round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, MouthShut.com, which is India's largest consumer review platform with reviews on a million products. Mr. Farooqi has a degree in information systems and finance from State University of New York and was amongst the lead petitioners who challenged the various sections of the IT Act, which finally resulted in a victory for the entire nation when the Supreme Court declared 66A as illegal and diluted many other sections. I'm sure this deserves a round of applause again. Next in our panel is Mr. Gaurav Kachru, CEO, Internet and TV Commerce with the India Today Group. Please put your hands together for Mr. Kachru. He has led businesses for Fortune 100 companies, previously helped found and built two e-commerce businesses in India, FashionNU.com and DealsNU.com. He is passionate about building innovative and practical solutions for growing the digital ecosystem in India. He currently also serves on the boards of four companies as a director and one as a board observer. Welcome, sir. And finally, I would like to request all of you to please join me in welcoming Ms. Nidhi Agarwal, founder and CEO of Karya Lifestyle Solutions. <laughs> Hi ma'am, welcome. Well, an unmatched apparel brand that caters to women's non-casual wear by offering the best possible fit and flatters different body types. She is also a certified chartered accountant from KPMG and an MBA from Kellogg School of Management. Ms. Agarwal has 15 plus years of experience in strategy, new technology, marketing and finance. Please put your hands together in synergy for our distinguished panelist. Over to Mr. Mensik for chairing the session. Uh, thank you for that, that kind introduction. And Bithika, thank you for providing this opportunity to lead what I think is going to be a, a really terrific panel. I was running a panel a couple of weeks ago in Chicago, likewise, at the end of the session. And the night before, I had received a kind of a nervous call from one of the panelists. Uh, he he, he kind of was a little concerned that at the end of the day, everybody's going to be more or less falling asleep. And when he arrived the next day, he had a box with him. And I thought, you know, a box. And he opens it up, and it's full of little bottles of energy drink, 
which he proceeded to distribute to everybody in the room. Um, it did it did make for a more lively uh, a more lively session. Um, the topic is. Yeah, could you put up the presentation, please? Is, as uh, the program describes, um, evaluating consumer rights and e-commerce transactions in India. Um, and it really, if you read the program, uh, with the focus, the key question that we're going to try to address here is how to protect consumer welfare. Um, and the interests, the particular interests uh, that we are seeking to discuss how they are protected are, as, uh, according to the program, and it makes total sense to me, you know, how to create trust, um, how to protect privacy, how to ensure consumer sovereignty, which I understand to mean uh, control, consumer control. And uh, the comment is made in the program that the watchdogs are not particularly vigorous um, in India. And so it ends by asking, OK, what steps are companies taking to protect uh, consumers in, in India? And that, that is going to be the, very much the focus of, of this discussion. Um, and we've got a terrific panel to address the question. I was asking myself on the way over, you know, so how do I add any value um, to this discussion? Uh, I certainly am not going to comment on Indian law. Uh, that would constitute the unauthorized practice of law, and I do expect to get on a plane uh, at the end of the day today. So I thought, however, it might be helpful to the panelists as well as uh, some of you in the audience to hear a little bit about how other countries answer this question. Um, so I'm going to spend just a second running very quickly. We're going to gallop through some things here, but hopefully it'll help provide a context for then the discussion that will ensue. These are sort of the key questions when somebody comes in and says, I'm setting up an uh, uh, e-commerce site, or I'm setting up a sharing site, or I'm doing Internet of Things. Um, the, 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 the sorts of questions that the lawyers hope that the le ap applicable legal framework answers are, are these. Um, contract formation, legality of terms, website compliance, dispute resolution, the big one, data privacy, security, and then advertising and marketing. Most of these questions are frankly touched by the applicable warranty and consumer protection law of the jurisdiction. So, you know, to form a contract, what sort of express assent uh, is required? Does the law say anything about whether it's important to scroll through the terms or just can I click I accept? Legality of the terms, are there specific legal provisions that have to go into the terms of use or have to go into the privacy policy? Or are there more general doctrines in the United States? We have a notion of unconscionability that may impact what I've tried to insert into, into my terms. Um, are there particular features that the website has to, uh, has to have in order to comply with applicable consumer protection law? Dispute resolution, how am I going to handle that? And is the way that I have specified disputes will be resolved enforceable under applicable law? Data privacy, and I'll come back to that in a second. Advertising and marketing, that's an area where there's been, frankly, in recent times, quite a lot of development in terms of consumer protection guidance uh, with behavioral advertising and, and regulation of the use of cookies. Um, and now uh, the, the whole field of analytics, data analytics, is generating quite a lot of regulation, new regulation, in terms of advertising and marketing. Data protection. Uh, we, you know, we could spend an entire session on data protection. I'll just say, for those of you who are interested, in the United States, there's sort of two approaches, right? There's, there's the omnibus law that the EU has, has implemented, and then there is the more sectorial approach 
Uh, actually, it comes out of consumer protection law that, we, uh, that we've adopted in, in the United States. And as I say, we could spend a lot of time on that. But let me go back to the consumer protection rules just for a second, if I may, um, and, and sort of draw, give you a bit of a picture of how, how it, this is approached in the EU versus how it is approached in the United States. Um, and it's fair to say at a very high level that the approach in the EU is far, far, far more prescriptive than it is in the United States. In the United States, it's, it's generally more normative. Um, and the rules in Europe were recently changed with a new directive that replaced what used to be called the distance selling rules, a directive that uh, came out in 2011, went into effect about June of, of last year. And if you kind of try to really boil down what the changes introduced uh, were all about, uh, it's basically three areas. Greater specificity around the information that has to be made available to the consumer, both pre-contract and after contract. Uh, changes to the so-called cooling off rules. And then some specific prohibited costs um, that are, cannot be now included. And let's take just maybe a real quick closer look at that. The pre-contract. Okay, this is information that the site has to make available to the consumer before the consumer clicks, I accept. You have to remind them that they have a cancellation right. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. There has to be a real big pay now or some other button that makes it clear before the consumer undertakes a financial obligation that it is about, he or she is about to undertake a financial obligation. It's got to be prominent. It's got to be conspicuous. If what is being supplied through the site is digital content, there has to be adequate, sufficient information about that content, what's required to use it, compatibility and the like. There has to be a model withdrawal form that's tied to the right to cancel. We'll come back to that, as I said, in a minute. There's a certain amount of basic information that absolutely has to be prominently displayed to the customer, including what is the total price, including inclusive of that for the particular item or the particular service or the particular content that the consumer is, is buying. And issues around contract renewal, if this is ongoing service, contract renewal, minimum and duration, all of that has to be addressed. And it's got to be addressed, again, before the contract is formed. Once the contract is formed, the site has to be able to provide the consumer with the ability to basically keep a copy of the contract in durable medium, okay, which is basically a storage in a manner accessible for future reference and reproduction. And just sending an email that links to those terms is not sufficient. Turning quickly to the cooling off period, this was one I, I find interesting. Um, generally speaking, anybody who buys anything online, service, content, what have you, has a right to change their mind within the first 14 days and basically cancel or withdraw, rescind uh, the agreement. And if this right is not brought to the consumer's attention, before they click, I accept, guess what the consequence is, right? The cooling off period goes from 14 days to 12 months. Well, imagine going to your CFO and saying, oops, on our site for Europe, I forgot to put the cooling off reminder. Just think what that does to revenue recognition, right? The contract could be rescinded by the consumer for the next year. The rules are a little bit different for uh, non-tangible digital goods. We talk about that in the break if anybody is interested. And then prohibited things include, for example, including any pre-ticked boxes on the website and including certain charges. So that, this is all, I mean, it's, this is a lot of detail, folks, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of like, ooh, this is a good news 
this is a maximum directive as opposed to a minimum directive, so it's the most that any particular country in the EU can do as opposed to the minimum, so that's at least good. But this is highly prescriptive stuff. And then just quickly, real quickly, to contrast that with the approach in the United States. And I'm, I'm oversimplifying this, admittedly, but in the United States it comes down to 10 magic words in the Fair Trade Commission Act. And you see them right there. The FTC, the Fair Trade Commission, can take administrative actions against any unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. Okay? And you say, oh, well, what unfair. What is an unfair act? Well, an unfair act, as you can see from the slide, is anything that A, causes injury or is likely to cause injury to a consumer, okay, so is likely to cause injury or actually injures the consumer, and B, is not reasonable, reasonably avoidable by the consumer nor offset by some kind of countervailing benefit. And, you know, what does that, what, what does all that mean? Well, there are, there's a whole line of, 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 of cases that give meaning to those 10 words. And one of the most recent ones is what I refer to up there, the Wyndham case, where the FTC actually found Wyndham, Wyndham is a, a, a hotel hospitality chain, found Wyndham had engaged in unfair practices by failing to, to have adequate security in their IT and their online system. The passwords were too weak, the firewalls were too weak, there was insufficient use of encryption. So, I mean, imagine that. You've got the Consumer Protection Agency going after a company under these 10 words and finding that their security policies and practices are unfair to consumers and ordering them to beef those up. Security, obviously, is a big issue in the United States. I'm not going to spend any time on this, but I don't want to leave the U.S. law without just pointing out there's more to it. It tends to be very specific. You know, we, if, if you're dealing with children, they have special protection. Uh, if you're dealing with behavioral advertising, there's some opt-out rights, and you have then another overlay of sort of more specific protection, uh, as well as a counterpart to the FTC uh, general prohibition at, at the state level. And by the way, you know, we have 50 states, but I often say in the United States, you got three buckets of law. You got the federal law, you got the state law, and then you got California. Because California is always more strict than most of the other states. So at a high level, you know, if I step back, it, at, and, and try to summarize in terms of what consumer protection looks like in the United States. You know, there's generally a view that the rules are no different for e-commerce than anything else. It all really, really, really boils down to uh, effective disclosures. Um, if they're qualifications, they got to be clear and conspicuous, and then there's a bag of, you know, sort of more specific stuff that you got to worry about, spam and spyware and ad, ad, adware and the like. If, you know, if it, it left me thinking, okay, what path will you take here in India? You know, what path are you on? Are you likely to go the more normative approach that we have in the United States, particularly given how quickly the technology is changing, you know, or is the more appropriate path for India, is it uh, the more prescriptive EU approach? Uh, that would be a good uh, law school type discussion, but we're here to discuss uh, the more practical subject of what companies are doing to protect uh, consumer welfare. And what we propose to do is um, have each of our panelists offer some introductory remarks and then we've got some questions that we're going to be bouncing around up here. Um, but please, uh, most important, it's questions from all of you. So as we're going along, if you have questions, let's not wait for the end to take your questions, okay? Um, too soon for the first question. 
Who would like to offer some introductory remarks first? Thank you, Mike. Uh, that was beautiful. I think that really set the agenda, and uh, it was very um, effective in terms of under you know making us understand and realize that how uh, I wouldn't use the right word primitive, but we are still far behind in terms of consumer rights um, in this country. Normative approach, government intervention, uh, or probably consumer empowerment is the need of the hour. Um, I've been asked uh, to represent a company which uh, popularizes itself in keeping its mouth shut. And uh, the feeling that I have right now, uh, you know, I have a very mixed feeling right now because uh, how many of you are lawyers here are connected with the legal community? A lot of lawyers. A lot of them. Almost. Um, when I first started this business, I was told lawyers and entrepreneurs don't go together. And I was so wrong. And I'll tell you why. The feeling of my heart right now, and I will sum it in an Urdu couplet, a verse. Sukune dil ke liye kuch to ehtemam karu. Zara nazar mile to jhukke salam karu. Meaning, for the peace of my heart, I should bow down and salute you. Sukoon e dil ke liye kuch to ehtamam karu, zara nazar mile to jhukke salam karu. Mujko to hosh nahi aapi kijiye faisla, kahan se chhedu phansana, kahan se tamam karu. Which means, where should I start my story and where should I, be, you know, where should I begin, where should I end? Uh, really, that is a feeling of my heart. And Lawyers are the peace, are the instruments of peace for my heart. Because if you sit in my chair and the office from where I operate, I get legal notices upon legal notices left, right, center. I got my first legal notice of 50 crores when I was just celebrating my 24th birthday. The biggest I've got is $400 million, is 2,000 crores, by a gentleman named Mr. Kumar of Kumar Builders of Pune. So whoever gave me that inspiration idea that lawyers and entrepreneurs don't go together was wrong. Because now in my phone, out of 908 contacts that I have, I have 98 lawyers. At one point of time, we had 790 legal notices from every police station in this country. 12 court cases. So we said, what do we do? There were two provisions that were really affecting us. Because we thought that India was this utopian country where every customer is different. And I thought every shopkeeper, brand, knew this. And then they wanted to customize their product. But they didn't realize that every interaction is recorded. Which means that each time you buy something, the consumer is remembering something. And then everybody wanted loyal customers. And loyalty really is all about interaction and expression. But they just wanted to sell. Nobody wanted to build a connection with the customer. And nobody wanted to make them fall in love. They just wanted to sell. As a result, people took recourse in the absence of an FTC and some Consumer Protection Act 1986. There is one. Um, how many of you know that? They took resort to mouthshut.com to settle their scores. And the victim was yours truly. So every police brand and every legal lawyer with a degree to his name would send us legal notice, saying, standard, please reveal the IP address of the following reviews, the name of the person who wrote, the date it was written, and please delete it. 
Some of them, that was courteous, please delete it. Some of them said, you are hereby ordered to delete it. When we refused, they would say, well, section 79, rules 3B says that you have to take action. IT Act was amended in 2011 that put the onus on publishers like us to remove it within 36 hours. There was section 66A, a beautiful section, but the laws and the wordings used, I love lawyers, they use such beautiful words that entrepreneurs just grapple, how did they come up with? It says any affected party can get content removed. And if you post something that is affecting somebody, I can put you in jail. So they said, if you don't reveal, or if you don't remove the content, reveal the name of the person so that we can prosecute that person under 66A. If I don't reveal, then I'm being sued. If I reveal, then the customer or the person who wrote on mouth shirt will be arrested. Now I'm trying to juggle. Faisal Faruqi is, is now the judge to decide whether the content is defamatory or not. Thousands and thousands and thousands of reviews. We don't have that capability. We're not the judge. People told me don't hire lawyers. Lawyers are not good friends with entrepreneurs. Well, we did hire lawyers in every nook and breadth of the country. And we approached the Supreme Court. And we said, we get hurt each time there's a legal notice. Our employees get, get scared. They get calls from cybercrime and police stations. And many of them are threatened. We need protection. Now, in the olden days, people used to say that you need protection against goons. And you get all these personal security guards, you know, trig and all those. We needed legal protection. How do I protect myself from all these legal notices? So we challenged the rules and 66A. And we all know the wording, thankfully. And thanks to lawyers. I really appreciate you and love you for your work. Now, how do we move forward? The other day, um, I was on CNBC Awaz, and one of the questions that was raised was, do we need government intervention now that the flip cards of the world and Snapdeal and Amazon are so big and powerful? And we have the odd stories of people buying something and getting bricks or stones in their package. And of course, the very odd story of somebody who managed to fleece Flipkart. I think the government regulation is enough. We need to have, as e-commerce fraternity, as entrepreneur, I will say that we should self-regulate. A lot of us are really doing that. We are doing in terms of 30-day no, you know, no question asked policy. Exchange is very liberal. Refunds are very liberal. And we are trying to pamper and delight our customers. But at some point, if you are looking to start your business, Please know that if the threshold of this crosses and the voices in Delhi and Parliament, they hear too much frustration on the part of customers, then they will try and intervene. Like we know that the government is putting a lot of pressure on telecom companies to compensate us for every dropped calls. Now the government did not want to intervene, but they are intervene intervening now because all our calls are dropped calls. It's 30 seconds we are able to talk, and 45 minutes we are not able to talk. So the need of the hour is self-regulation. And I have you know, my colleagues from some very consumer-friendly companies here uh, on the panel. They will share what they are doing in their companies to pamper you, to refund you, to give you free rides from here to the airport all the time. And I just hope, and I sincerely pray, that if you're an entrepreneur out there, then don't go by the advice that was given to me. Because if you are starting your business, you should have at least 90 lawyers as your friends. Thank you. Thank you. Those were uh, great comments. Thank you so much, Fazit. We indeed love to give free rides to the people who wanted to go to airport. Uh, the business in which we are 
I'm sure there may be many people in this room who may, might not be happy with our services some or the other day. And they must be writing on the mouth shirt about us, sharing their feedback or their discomfort. But interestingly, it's just, a, it's just last 12 months when we have grown so much. Uh, from 6,000 rides a day across the country to 7 lakh rides a day across the country, there is a huge jump in the in the in the in the you know the magnitude of service that we have we have we are giving the problem here is our service or our product is not very standardized and it's a it's a unique situation where neither the car is ours nor the driver is ours nor we can control his behavior and when it, when it comes to a consumer right the, the kind of service that consumer is getting is a, is a cab ride. And we are, and like uh, Faisal said, every day around 80 to 100 legal notices we also receive from across the country. And they are saying your cab is late or the driver was rude. And interestingly there was a case where a lady sent a legal notice of 50 lakh rupees of compensation because she used our auto rickshaw, not our auto rickshaw, she used an auto rickshaw booked on our mobile application and she forgot her keys in that. And just because she was not 